thank you for that um, soul-swelling introduction. Uh, thank you very much. It's lovely to be back. It's always an honour and a pleasure. Always is my second time. So on both occasions, it's been an honour and a pleasure to teach at Clarion West. Um, investing in the future of talent. It's been, yeah, it's a, it's a great thing to do. Um, I was very, very tempted to change my reading at the last moment and read the bit from Brazil. Uh, my, my novel about, ha <laughs> someone's way ahead of me here, <laughs> way ahead of me, and read the bit about um, the first uh, catastrophic Brazilian World Cup failure in 19. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a kind man and I want to go back, I and mean, I know quite a lot of Brazilians, and if there are any here, they would probably kick me to death. <laughs> and I would wish so I'm not going to do that, I'm, I'm going to read from a work in progress. Uh -huh. um, I'm still writing about developing societies, rapidly industrialization, new nation, rapidly industrializing new nations and uh, multicultural futures. This one just happens to be on the moon. Um, how long have I got, by the way? Can you hear me now? Hang on. Yeah. As long as you want. <laughs> well, remember that the store closes at 8 and the tills close at 10 to 8, so that gives you 10 minutes of shoplifting. <laughs> okay, some of you have heard one sentence from this today. <laughs> okay, in a white room on the ocean of storms sit six naked teenagers, three boys, three girls. The skins are black, yellow, brown, white. They scratch at their skins, that's better. <laughs> they scratch at their skins constantly and intently. Depressurization dries hide and breeds itches. The room is tight, a barrel barely large enough to stand up in. The kids are wedged onto benches facing each other, thighs pressed against their neighbours, knees touching those opposite. There is nowhere to look and nothing to see except each other, but they're shy of eye contact. Too close, too exposed. Each breathes through a transparent mask. Oxygen hisses where the seals are inexact. Just below the window on the outblock door is a pressure meter. It stands at 15 kilopascals. It has taken an hour to bring the pressure this low. But outside is vacuum. Lucasinho leans forward and once again looks through the small window. The destination gate is easily visible. The line from him to it is straight and open. The sun is low. The shadows are long and profound, thrown towards him. Blacker on the black regolith. They could, they could conceal many treacheries. Surface temperature is 120 Celsius, as Familiar had warned. It will be a fire walk. Fire walk? An ice walk. Seven kilopascals. Lucas Senior feels bloated, his skin taut and unclean. When the meter reads five, the lock will open. Lucas Senior wishes his Familiar was with him. Gingy could have died, uh, dialed down his racing heart, still the twitching muscle in his right thigh. His eyes catch those of the girl opposite him. She is an Asamoa. Her older brother sits beside her. Her fingers twist an amulet around her neck. Her familiar would have wondered about that. Metal can flash well to skin out there. She might wear the, the mark of Onyame as skin tissue, a scar tissue forever. She gives him a fractional smile. There are six naked, good-looking teenagers pressed thigh to thigh, but the chamber is a sexual vacuum. Every thought is turned to what is beyond the lock. To Asima was a sun girl, a Mackenzie girl, a scared Veronso boy hyperventilating, Lucasinho Alves Maldeferro Arena de Corta. I practiced that. <laughs> <laughs> Lucasinho is hooked up with all of them except the Mackenzie girl. Cortas and Mackenzies don't hook up. And Abena, Abena Manu Asamoa, because her perfection intimidates Lucasinho Corta. Her brother, though, he gives the best blowjobs. 20 metres. 15 seconds. Jinji has burned those numbers into him. The distance to the second lock. The time a naked human body can survive hard vacuum. 15 seconds before unconsciousness. 30 seconds before irreversible damage. 20 metres, 10 strides. Lucas Senior smiles at handsome Abena Asamoa. Then lights flash red. Lucas Senior is on his feet as the lock opens. The last breath of pressurisation shoots out of him, so he shoots him out onto the ocean of storms. Stride one. His right foot touches the regolith and drives every thought from his head. Eyes burn, lungs blaze. He is bursting. Strike two. Breathe out, out. Zero pressure in your lungs, Jinji said. No, it's wrong, it's death. Breathe out or your lungs will explode. His foot comes down. Strike three. 
He exhales. The breath freezes on his skin. The water on his tongue. The tears in the corner of his eyes are boiling. Four. Abena Asamoah streaks ahead of him. Her skin is grey with frost. Five. His eyes are freezing. He daren't blink. Eyelids would freeze shut. Blink is blind. Blink is dead. He fixes on the, fixes on the far lock, ringed with blue navigation lights. The skinny Voronsov boy passes him. He runs like a madman. Six. His heart is panicking, fighting, burning. Abena Asamoah throws herself into the lock, looks around as she reaches for the mask. Her eyes go wide. She sees something behind Lucasino. Her mouth opens in a silent cry. Seven. He looks over his shoulder. Kojo Asamo is down, tumbling, rolling. Kojo Asamo is drowning in the ocean of storms. Eight. As he lunges towards the blue lock lights, Lucasino throws his arms out and breaks his headlong flight. Nine. Kojo Asamoah struggles to find his feet, but he's blind, dust frozen to his eyeballs. He waves his hands, lurches, stumbles forward. Lucasino growls an arm. Up! Up! Ten. The red is pulsing in his eyes, a circle of light and consciousness focused on the circle of the entry lock. A circle closing in with every pulse of the red in his disintegrating brain. Breathe! His lungs shriek. Breathe! Up! Up! The lock is full of arms and faces. Lucasinho throws himself at the circle of reaching arms. His blood is boiling. Gas bubbles in his veins, each bubble a white hot ball bearing. His strength is failing. His mind is dying, but he doesn't let go of Kojo's arm. He feels a shock. He hears a shriek of blast pressurization. In the tiny circle of light he has left, he sees a tangle of limbs, skins, asses and bellies, drop dripping with concentration, uh, condensation and sweat. He hears gasps turn and turn to laugh, laughs. Sobs to insane giggling. The bodies quiver with crazy laughing. We did the moon run. We beat Lady Moon. Another flash of vision. A splatter of red on the centre line of the inlock door. Weird red on white. He fixes on this red. A red bullseye that draws all his awareness into the line between him and it. As his consciousness slips into the dark, he understands what the red spot is. Blood. The outlock door has slammed shut on Kojo Asamoah's left big toe, smashing it to a smear of flesh. Dark now. And <laughs> <laughs> the soaring woman comes out of the top of the thermal. Early light turns her to gold. She scrapes the very roof of the world, then arches her back, tucks in her arms, flicks her feet and stoops into a swallow dive. 100, 200 metres she plummets, a black dot hurtling out of the false dawn of the skyline, past factories and apartments, windows and balconies, cableways and elevators, walkways and bridges. At the last in instant she flexes her fingers, spreads nanofiber primary feathers and pulls out of the dive. And up. Sweeping high, her wings flashing in the brightening light. In three wing beats she is a kilometre away, a fleck of gold against Orion Quadra's monument monumental canyonscape. Bitch, Marina Galzaggi whispers. She hates the flying woman's freedom, her athleticism, her perfect skin and tight gymnastic body. <coughs> Most of all, she hates that the woman has breath to waste on flying, and Marina must fight and pay for every sip of air. Marina has dialed down her breathing reflex. The chib on her eyeball shows Marina's increasing oxygen debt. Every lungful costs. She is overdrawn at the breath bank. She remembers the feeling of panic. Ah, somebody got the joke. <laughs> she remembers the feeling of panic when she first tried to blink the new chib out of her eye. It wouldn't go. She followed it with a finger. It remained bonded to her eye. Everyone wears one, the Lunar Development Corporation induction and acclimatization agents had said. Whether they're a Joe Moonbeam straight off of the moon loop or the eagle of the moon himself. The status bar for a four fundamentals had ticked into life. Water, carbon, data, air account status. From that moment, they charged every sip and sleep, every feed and thought and breath. By the time Marina gets to the top of the staircase, her head is swimming. She leans against the low railing and fights for breath. Before her, the terrifying crowded void, brilliant with thousands of lights. Meridian's quadras are dug a kilometre deep and they obey an inverted social order. The rich live low, the poor live high. Ultraviolet, cosmic rays, charged particles from solar flares bombard the naked face of the moon. <coughs> the radiation is readily absorbed by a few metres of lunar regolith, but high-energy cosmic rays spark off 
and a fire-up cascade of secondary particles from the soil that can deeply damage human DNA. So human habitats dig deep, and citizens live as far from the surface as they can afford. Only the industrial levels are higher than Marina Calzaghi, and they are almost completely automated. Up against the false sky bobs a single silver child's balloon, trapped. Marina Calzaghi is going up to sell the contents of her bladder. The piss buyer nods her into his booth. Her piss is scanty, ochre and grainy. Does she see tinges of blood? The piss buyer assays her minerals and nutrients and credits her. Marina transfers the funds to her, her network account. You can turn down your breathing, pyre of water, scrounge for food, but you cannot beg bandwidth. Hetty, her familiar, coalesces out of a spray of pixels over her left shoulder. She's a basic free skin, a, a glowing sphere, but Marina Calzaghi is back on the network again. Next time, she whispers as she, as she ascends again, <clears throat> up to the fog trap. I'll get the pharma next time, Blake. Marina climbs the last few steps on hands and feet. The web of plastic was a top scavenge, snatched and secreted before the salvage robots could recycle it. The principle is ancient and trustworthy. Plastic mesh slung between support beams. Warm, moist air rises, and in the cool of the artificial night forms brief cirrus clouds. The mist condenses on the fine mesh and drips down in the strands into drinkable amounts of water in the collecting jar. A sip for her, a sop for Blake. There is someone at her trap. A tall, moon-thin man drinks from her collecting jar. Give me that! The man looks at her, then drains the jar dry. That's not yours. She still has some earth muscle definition left. Even with no air in her lungs, she could take him big, frail, pap big, frail, big, pale, fragile moonflower. Get out of here. This is mine. Not anymore. There is a knife in his hand. She can't beat a knife. I see you back here again. I find anything gone, I'll cut you up and sell you. There's nothing she can do. No action, no words, no threats or clever ideas can change anything. This man with a knife has crushed her. All she can do is skulk away. Every step, every rung down the ladders is an agony of shame. She is shaking so hard she can hardly see. At a small gallery from which she saw the flying woman, she falls to her knees and wretches with clenching dry anger dry and clenching and heaving and unproductive. There is no moisture, no food left inside her. Up and out on the moon. Lucasinho wakes. A clear shell lies over his face so close his breath mists it. He panics, raises hands to beat the claustrophobic thing away from his face. Dark warmth spreads through his skull, the back of his head, down his arms, his torso. No panic. Sleep. The last thing he sees is the figure at the foot of his bed. He knows it isn't a ghost, because there are no ghosts on the moon. Its rock rejects them. Its radiation and vacuum dispel them. Ghosts are fragile things, vapours and tints and sighs. But the figure stands like a ghost, grey, hands folded. Madrina Flavia? The ghost looks up and smiles. <coughs> Lucasinho wakes. He tries, she tries to sit up and pain drives him back down onto the bed. He aches from the inside out, as if every muscle in his body has been pulled away from its bone or joint, and that space filled with ground glass. He lies on a bed, dressed in a pressure skin, the same you would wear for a sane, safe, ordinary walk on the surface. He can move his arms, his hands. His fingers walk up and down his body, stop taking the abs, the armour of muscle across his belly, his thighs tight and defined, his ass feels Fabulous. <laughs> he wishes he could touch his skin. He needs to know his skin is good. He is famous for his skin. <coughs> I feel like shit. Even my eyes hurt. Am I getting drugs? The mute opioid clusters in your periaqueductal -aqueduct grey are under direct stimulation, says a voice in his head. I can adjust the input. Hey, Ginger, you're back. No mistaking the picky, butlerish speech of his familiar. Familiars have a problem with ambiguity. He's aware of the chib in the bottom right corner of his vision. Quarters don't need to notice those numbers, but he's glad it's back. The chib tells him he's alive, aware, consuming. Uh, where am I? Gingy says, you're in the Sanifil Meridian Medical Facility. You've been moved from a, from a hyperbaric chamber to a compression skin. You've been in the series of medically induced comas. How long? He tries to, he tries to sit upright. 
Pair, pain tears along every bone and joint. My party! They'll wait. You're due another induced coma now. Your father is coming to see you. White articulated medical arms unfold from the walls. Wait, wait, no, I, I saw Flavia. Yes, she came to see you. Don't tell him. He has never understood why his father banished his madrina, his host mother, from Boa Vista the morning of Lucasino's 16th birthday. He just knows that if Lucas Corta learns that Madrina Flavia has been there, his father will hurt her with a hundred spitefulnesses. I won't, says Gingy. <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that the man from Uncle? Kind of? <laughs> God would not punish the woman who thieves in desperation. Marina passes the street, street shrine, Ooh, street shrine, every day on her way back from the piss buyer. An icon of Our Lady of Kazan attended by a constellation of pulsing biolites. Each of those blobs of jelly contains a mouthful of water. Quickly, sinfully, she jams them into her backpack. She'll give four of them to Blake. He's thirsty all the time. It's only been two weeks, but Marina feels she's known Blake a lifetime. Poverty stretches time. And poverty is an avalanche. One tiny slippage knocks another. Knocks loose yet another's, yet others, and then everything is sliding and rushing away from you. One cancelled contract. One day the agency didn't call, and those tiny digits in the corner of her vision kept ticking away, sliding, rushing away. And then she was climbing up the ladders and staircases, up the walls of Orion Quadra, climbing up from the weft of bridges and galleries, up above the avenues of apartments, up the ever steeper staircases and ladders, for elevators cost. And to those highest levels, the elevators do not go at all. Up towards the, over, the overhanging stacks and cubes of Barno Alto. The thin air smelled of fireworks. Raw stone, still fresh from the construction bots, sintered glass. Walkways lurched perilously past the door curtains of stone cells, lit only by what light fell through their doors and unglazed windows. One false step was a long, slow scream down to the neons of Gargarin Prospect. Barlow Alto changed with every passing loon, and Marina wandered far before finding Blake's room. Apt to share, per diems pooled, read the ad in the Meridian listings. I'm not staying long, she said, looking round at the single room with the two memory foam mattresses, the empty plastic water bottles, the discarded food trays. You never do, Blake said. Then his eyes bulged, and he doubled over in a racking, sterile cough that shook every rib and spar in his sparse frame. The hacking cough kept Marina awake all that night. Three dry, almost petulant little coughs. Then three more. Three more. Three more. The cough, cough kept her awake every subsequent night. Silicosis. Moon dust was turning his lungs to stone. With the paralysis, tuberculosis. Proprietary antibiotics treated it easily. People who lived in Barno Alto spent their money on air, water and carbon. Even cheap antibiotics are a distant hope. Marina. It's been so long since her familiar spoke to her that she falls off the ladder in surprise. You have a job offer. The fall is only a handful of metres, nothing in this crazy gravity. She still has flying dreams. In them she is a wind-up bird orbiting a clockwork orrery, an orrery spinning in a stone cage. I'll take it. It's catering. <laughs> I cater. She'll do anything. She scans the contract. She's bit, she bit herself low, but the offer is barely adequate. It's her air, water, carbon network and a little bit more. There's an upfront payment. She'll need a new uniform from the print, from the print house and a bath and a banya. She can smell her hair. She hates smelling her hair. And a train fare. She has an hour to be in Central Station. Marina blinks up a signature. Her contact lens scans and transmits her retinal patterns to the agency. Familiar's handshake, and there is money in her account. The joy is so sharp it hurts. The might and magic is money of money is not what it allows you to own. It is what it allows you to be. Money is freedom. Take it up, she says to Hetty. Restore defaults. Inst instantly the tightness in her lungs releases. Exhaling is wonderful. Inhaling is an exaltation. Marina savours the meridian perfume. Electricity and gunpowder and sewage tang and mould. And when she gets to where the breath should end, there's more. 
she draws deep. But time is tight. To make the train, she'll have to take the, eleva- the 15 and A elevator, but that's in the opposite direction to Blake's place. Elevator or Blake? There's no decision. <laughs> <coughs> Lucas Senior waits, wakes, wakes, Lucas Senior wakes. His father stands at the foot of the bed. A short man, slight, dark and haunted as his older brother is broad and golden. Poised and polished, a pencil line of moustache and beard, no more. Perfect, but always scrutinising to keep that perfection. His clothes, his hair, his nails are immaculate. A cool, judging man. Above his left shoulder hovers his familiar, Toquinho. His familiar is intricate knot of musical notes and complex chords that occasionally resolves into a half-heard, whispered guitar chord. Lucas Corta applauds. Five clear claps. Congratulations, you're a runner now. It's known inside the family and out that Lucas Corta never made the the moon run. The reason remains a secret never to be told. Lucas Lucas Senior has heard that people who pry are punished. Badly. Lucas Senior swings off the bed. The medical bots have removed the pressure skin. He lightly brushes fingertips down his skin. It's fit and tight and like love to the touch. (coughs) Emergency team room, ophthalmics, pneumothoracic specialist, higher of hyperbaric chamber, higher of pressure skin, O2 charges, his father says. The white walls open around Lucas Senior, robot arms unfold with offers of clothing. Transfer from Meridian to Boa Vista. I'm at Boa Vista? You have a party to go to, a homecoming for a hero. Make an effort. Try to keep your cock out of someone for five minutes. Uh, everyone's here. Even Ariel's managed to, t- to tear herself away from the court of Clavius. But before anything else, the essentials. Metal studs and spikes in the careful holes in, in Lucasino's flesh. Each one the record of a heartbreak. Gingy shows Lucasino himself on the room camera so he can comb up his quiff to its full low-gravity magnificence. A deep-sea wave of glossy, thick hair. He admires himself in his inner familiar vision. Killer cheekbones only can bring rocks on his belly. He's taller than his father. Everyone in, in this generation is taller than the first generations. He's so freaking hot. <laughs> He'll live, Lucas says. Who? Lucas sees you hesitates between shirts before choosing the soft brown moral pattern. Uh, Gojo Asamoah. He has 20% second degree burns, ruptured alveoli, burst blood vessels, brain lesions, and the toe. He'll be all right. There's a, de- there's a delegation of Asamoahs waiting to thank you. A bane of As- Asamoah might be among them. Maybe then, maybe she might be so thankful he saved her, he saved her brother that she might, she might let him fuck her. Tan parts the two centimetre two centimeter turnips and six pleats. He snaps the belt shut. Spider silk socks and two-toned tan loafers. It's a party, so a sports jacket will be all right. He picks the tweed, feels a prickle of fibres between thumb and finger. That's animal stuff, not printed. Insanely expensive animal stuff. Lucas says, you could have died. As Lucas Senior slips the jacket on, he notices the pin on the lapel. Donna Luna the sigil of the moon runners, the patron saint of the moon, our lady of life and death, light and dark, one half of a face a black angel, the other a naked white skull, lady two-face, lady moon. What, Lucas says, would the family have done then? How did his father know he'd pick the jacket with a pin on it? Then Lucas Senior notices... <coughs> then Lucasina notices as the robot arms take the rest of the clothing into the walls that every jacket has a Donna Luna pin on it. Lucas says, I'd have left him if it had been me. I wasn't you, Lucasino says. Gingy shows Lucasino the total effect of his choice as smart, but not formal, casual but classy, and on the season's trend, which is American European 1950s, but not slavish. Lucas Senior Corta adores Cleo as an adornment. He is a macaw, a bird of paradise. He looks at himself again. 
I'm ready for my party now. Okay, uh, I'm done. Do you want more? <laughs> <laughs>